So, so. Well, I, you know, uh, let me just introduce you then. So Solomon came to uh, Lenox Hill. How's it been? Four years now? Five years? Four years, yeah. Four years. Uh, he is a um, really a luminary guy, not only as a neurologist, but in building stroke programs. He had one of the biggest, busiest stroke programs in New York City in, in Brooklyn. And I think he took on a much different problem. You know, New York City and Manhattan, we have a preponderance of great health care, great health systems. And so Lenox is a very different environment than where he was before, which was much more of a city hospital with a lots of ambulances. And so this is a much, in some ways, more difficult uh, project. And he met a lot of resistance when he got here from radiology, from nursing, from me, from whoever. And, uh, you know, he proved um, over just by grit, determination and focus of what, what someone can do well. And I, you know, he takes care of my family. He takes care of my patients. Um, and he is, to me, uh, one of the great reasons why our hospital and our neuroscience program has excelled. We just got ranked in the top 50 in the U.S. News and World Report. Yeah. In neuroscience, which is thanks to, uh, thanks to a great partnership with you. That's and it's a lot of it has wonderful. to do with our stroke program. So take it away, uh, Salman Azar. Thanks for being okay. with us. Okay. Looks like almost 1,800 people listening to you today. That's a good That's one. amazing. Thanks. That's amazing. All right, everyone. And, you know, this is uh, my first time doing brain turns, and maybe they won't invite me back after this one, but uh, because of, uh, but let's hope they do. So you guys are all going to help me by asking questions. And normally, if I was, if you were sitting all in front of me, um, you would, uh, I would be asking you questions because most people are afraid of asking questions. But since you're not, do, you're not doing that, I want you to feel comfortable asking questions. I will try and pay attention to those questions as we go along and, um, you know, give my answers to the best of my abilities. But most importantly, this is a really, obviously a huge topic, right? We are living in this pandemic and like anything else, uh, this virus is so different from other viruses that we have experienced, especially certainly even the flu virus that is sort of was the last pandemic we had, the Spanish flu. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit how why it's so different and why it affects the brain so much. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here, but I'll sort of go back and forth. Let's see, uh, share screen. I will go back and forth and... Um, uh, I think you can see that all. Let's start. All right. Great. So, again, um, thanks to everybody for uh, joining us today. We're going to talk a little bit about stroke, st how this virus actually may cause more strokes, and what what that means, and then um, how this pandemic actually is causing people to end up having more strokes at home and not seeking help for it. So, really. It's affecting every part of our lives and, and certainly uh, the brain is no exception to that. Now, all of you have probably heard this and if you haven't, you should know this, that besides affecting the lungs, COVID affects the lungs tremendously. And of course, you've all heard of people having uh, problems with pneumonias in the lungs, difficulty breathing, going on ventilators, and then ending up in the ICUs. And sometimes that's the people who end up in the ICUs are the ones who, you know, four weeks later, or uh, uh, and unfortunately, the ones who pass, who, who die. So it's a, it's a very tragic disease. And there has, number one, been this thought that it doesn't affect young people. And I'm here to tell you that it does. And I'll sh actually show you some work done uh, that shows that it actually can cause strokes in the young. Um, but it can also just cause a very nasty uh, uh, process that leads to, beyond strokes, other brain issues. So let's go through that a little bit. Before we do that, I'm going to start talking a little bit about what is a stroke. A stroke that, if you think about it, there are two types of stroke. There's a stroke that basically happens because the blood clot stops blood flow to a brain. So it comes from the heart, gets up to the brain. You stop the blood flow there, and all of a sudden, you've got no blood going to a part of the brain. And what I, you know, how I tell people is that if, if, you, if you have a risk factor stroke, and remember, we're seeing strokes in young people uh, even more so these days than we used to in the past, or at least we're recognizing them. And, and that's been really important. So even before COVID, we were seeing stroke in young. And, but what happens, the clot goes up there, it stops blood flow, and all of a sudden you stop being able to do something. It's either texting or it's walking or it's eating or it's talking. And we sort of look at these things, something called face arm speech kind of test, which is that does your face droop? 
Do you suddenly speak like you're slurring your speech? And of course, that's the face and, the, and then the arm, the arm drooping, and then the speech, the slurring speech. And then if that's happening, either in someone you know, or a family member, or your grandparents, what you really have to do is call 911 and get, the, get that, your, uh, you know, that person to the, uh, to the hospital. And if you do do that, then we're able to actually go in there in a very cool way. And you may have already seen some of these images before, but go in in a very cool way and actually pull these clots out. And so these are, I'm giving you a high level sort of shortened view of- Hey, Dr. Zahar. Uh, yes. Um, you're on presenter view right now. Do you want to do a normal view? Because we can like see the, the presenter view right now on the screen share. No, I, it's, I, I think this is, the no, a normal view is fine if you want. If they, let's, you're, seeing, you're seeing my screen, right? Yeah, we're seeing your screen. So we're seeing like the, the presenter view with like the next slide coming up as well. Oh, okay, no. So let's do normal view. Let's do, um, how do I do that? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. All right. Is that better? Can you see me now? Um, it's now just like the main screen without like a, a a sharing view. It's All just right. the. Hold on. Uh, you, I says it says. Let me stop the screen sharing for a second. All right, and let's go back to. Um, let's see if that helps. How about now? Did you, did you, you want to just, did you hit from beginning? That might just give you the normal view. No, you know what, Let's, I, I'm fine with doing the other way. I don't think it's that crucial in that sense. Um, let me stop there and then just, in the interest of time, I don't waste time trying to sort of, um, Oh, so you see at the top where it says use presenter view in the middle of your screen, where it says monitors. Yeah. yeah, so you have to uncheck that. And then if you hit from beginning, it will turn off the presenter view. Uh, actually, I don't see the use presenter view. It's right in the middle where it says right above, like where stroke is, monitors. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um... So if you just uncheck that box. Oh, got it. Okay, there we go. Yeah, and I'll just hit from beginning, and then it will. Okay. You see it now? No. That's... I think. How about now? No. I th did you hit resume slideshow? Let's stop that. One more time, guys. Sorry about this. Um, Perfect. All right. Okay. So let me just, um, all right. So if I just make this, so we were talking about, um, let's see, let's go back one. All right, so this is the stent retriever, and we were talking about the idea of pulling these clots out. And what you do is you actually insert a catheter into the groin or into the arm, take that catheter up all the way to the brain, as you can see here, and then basically uh, deploy a stent, a sort of a wire mesh basket into the clot, and then suck, pull that clot out. And you can see this is, this is the wire mesh basket right here. And here's one with a clot sitting in it. So this has allowed us to really open up how we take care of stroke patients with clots and even treat patients who have strokes that are even up to 24 hours old. A second way that we do that 
is to um, oops, uh, use a penumbra aspiration or an, an aspiration catheter. And think about this as having a Dyson vacuum that sort of goes up to the clot right up here and sucks that clot out. So instead of having a basket of metal that, that traps the clot, you actually have a, a catheter that actually has a sucking, is a sucking catheter, a vacuum catheter, and you're able to actually suck that clot out. So both of these ways, either in combination or by themselves, have allowed us to really change the face of stroke and really open up what we do in stroke. So that's kind of, and then the final thing that has been really sort of very cool in stroke has been the ability to use something called a biological clock. So what do I mean by this? Everybody's different. If you have a clot that goes up to your brain, you immediately start, some of your brain starts to die right away. And when it does, um, you know, there's a big, you can think of this as a, as a small core part of your brain dying right away, but around that core is a bigger area that is at risk, that is just stunned. And if we can get in there and remove, remove that clot quickly, we'll be able to uh, save that brain. And so people actually, instead of get, you know, having paralysis and long-term paralysis, are able to walk out of the hospital. That's how game-changing this technology has been. The big thing here, though, is that we now want to know, okay, okay, that's great. You know, not everybody's brain is the same. Not everybody's blood vessels are the same. How can I tell you when you come into the hospital whether if we go after that clot, we'll actually be able to do the things that we we're going to do? And this is called basically what I call the biological clock way of looking at the brain, meaning that it, your brain is different from mine, so your brain may be dying at a much slower rate than mine might be doing. And interestingly, actually, young people may actually have a harder time with this because their may, brains, they may not have enough of these collateral blood vessels that feed other parts of the brain. But here's a, here's a case here. What you see on the right side of your screen is uh, the, 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 the same brain of a, say, of a patient. On the right side of the screen, you see this green area here. That's the brain at risk. This is done as soon as you come into the emergency room. That's the brain at risk. And when you see the brain at risk there, what you're going to, and on the left side is what the, the damaged brain is. So we have brain at risk and damaged brain. Now, if I go in and pull that clot out uh, right away, or actually this is done by the neurointerventionalists, we're able to save all of this brain. And in fact, the patient may be, may be completely back to normal by the next day. So they've not even had a, it looks like they haven't even had a stroke. And this is where, this is called the penumbra. This green area here is called the penumbra. And if we can open up the clot, we can save all of that brain that's green. If we don't open up the clot, or you don't get to us on time, then what ends up happening is that you end up damaging all of that green area. So you're not, then you're left with a very big stroke. A second case is here. Um, again, same thing. The one on the, 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 the images on the right side, the green images, are the ones where the brain tells you what's at risk. The images on the left side, the purple colored images, are the tells you what amount of brain is actually already damaged. Now here you will see that the difference, and you'll see at the bottom of the screen, 103 milliliters and 147 milliliters. The difference between that 44 milliliters is the area that I can save. The purple stuff is pretty much dead. The large green stuff has dead brain and a live brain. And if I pull the clot out there, I'm going to be able to save about a third of that brain, which still is important because that could be the difference between someone walking and not walking. So again, this is a, what this imaging called rapid perfusion imaging gives us the ability to tell well, how much brain is damaged, how much brain is at risk. And if we go and pull that clot out, what, are we, what can we hope to expect? And here's a case where obviously that's much worse. Here you can see on the right side in the top panel, basically a, a, the green image, a very large area of the brain, literally half of the brain here is involved. And then right here, you see that the purple area matches the green area. So this is called a match, a malignant profile where the brain is already damaged. And even if you went in and pulled clot out, we would not make a difference. And in fact, you see basically when we do an MRI in the lower right-hand side here, when we do an MRI uh, 20, uh, 48 hours later, all of that green area looks like it's damaged, right? So you can see this matches about this here, that matches about that. So again, here's another patient who unfortunately, their brain started dying right away and it died in a way that even if we had pulled the clot out, we would not have been able to save a large part of the brain. So the name of the game in stroke is, can you get in fast? Can you recognize the symptoms? Can you get in fast? And can we open up that clot? In a very simplified manner, that's sort of the important thing to think about. 
So how does this change with COVID? So let's just talk, step back from stroke a little bit and talk about what happens in COVID and what does COVID-19 do to the brain, right? So first of all, here are all the different things. This was a study that was published in The Lancet. Here are all the different things that can, COVID can cause in terms of the nervous system. So first of all, you, a lot of people present who, are, who have got an infection, young or old, with muscle aches and headaches. And that's pretty common to see that in patients with COVID presenting like that. And muscle aches are often due to damage to the muscles by, the, by, the, by COVID-19. And headaches can be actually due to inflammation or in the brain. Then you actually go, those are mild symptoms. Then you can actually present with actually an inflammation, such a severe inflammation of the brain, which is known as encephalitis, either infection or inflammation, or else myelitis, which is infection or inflammation of the spinal cord. Um, acute disseminated encephalitis, ADEM, is also another form of uh, encephalitis or an inflammatory process that's triggered by the virus and leads to uh, increasing leads to increasing inflammation in the brain and damages brain. Guillain-Barre syndrome. These are all neurological syndromes that happen because of COVID. This is a syndrome where you actually damage the nerves once they've left the spinal cord and leads to paralysis of breathing and movement. So somebody can come in unable to move anything, literally not able to move at all or having progressive weakness. And then finally, of course, strokes. A lot of uh, COVID patients may end up having uh, clinically silent strokes or actually have uh, obvious strokes and may present as their first symptom of COVID. So this is, a, uh, this is a study done here in New York where people who in their 40s, their first symptom of COVID was actually the, them having a stroke and presenting to the emergency room. Now, how does COVID actually affect the brain? It can, in fact, the virus can actually get into the brain itself, but we think that's relatively uncommon. And, and, the, and, you, and we've done a lot of studies now which actually haven't shown direct viral invasion. What actually happens because of COVID, of the virus, is that you end up getting so much inflammation in the body, and that inflammation then actually gets into the brain. And so it's actually the virus causing two major things from happening. Number one, it causes tremendous inflammation everywhere in the body. This is known as uh, basically a, sort of an, what we call a cytokine explosion. It, it's, it, it leads to so much inflammation that literally you get like a little bomb going off in your body. And you can end up causing damage of your lungs, of your brain, of your heart, of your kidneys, of your liver, of your muscles. So all of these things can get damaged by this severe onslaught of infection leading to inflammation, okay? That's important, that it is the body's immune response trying to fight the infection that ends up causing more damage. And that's why in some cases, in some patients, we know now that steroids can be very helpful at limiting um, the damage caused by this virus because they don't, they don't limit the virus, they limit the inflammation that happens from this virus. The second thing that can happen by this virus, and that's why this virus is so deadly to us, even in young people, is that it can actually invade, the virus can invade the blood vessel wall itself and can actually lead through multiple mechanisms to clotting of the blood vessels. So that can happen in the lungs, it can happen anywhere in the body, but really oftentimes will happen in the brain, leading to, as we talked earlier, a clot going up or a clot forming in the brain and leading to a stroke. Now again, what's important here is that this virus affects so many symptoms that it sometimes is hard to recognize which symptom is being in impacted. Oftentimes, the more severe infection that you have, the more likely are you to have brain and nervous system involvement. But remember, because of this clotting problem, because of the fact that virus actually damages the blood vessel and can cause clotting, it absolutely can cause, it can cause uh, damage to the brain right from the get-go, right from the start. You don't even need to have the lung in injury someone comes in with a big stroke because of, of the clotting issues. So it's important to understand this virus really has three ways that it can affect the nervous system. One, by direct invasion, going into the brain itself, less likely, but it can happen. Two, by causing this explosive uh, inflammation and immune response in the body, and brain gets very severely affected by that, leading to coma, not being able to wake up, not being able to move your arms and legs, and, and, and actually, uh, a fair amount of significant damage. And then number three, by causing clotting, by damaging the blood vessels and leading to clotting 
proteins being produced and ending up causing a severe amount of clotting. So three big ways that the virus damages our nervous system. Okay, so this is a complicated schematic of what the virus is doing. And here you can see the SARS-CoV-2 virus there, and it's affecting the endothelium, the, the inner lining of the blood vessel. Here you can see that, and by leading to that, and I, and I don't want you to pay attention so much to the detail, but understand the complexity of what this virus does. You can see that this virus causes up down regulation of certain proteins on the endothelium, making them making the inner lining of the blood vessel much more sticky. By doing that, it also causes expression of things called cytokines and chemokines. These are uh, chemical mediators that the uh, cells produce that lead to even more clotting and spasm of the blood vessel. And then it causes this hyperinflammation. All of this that can happen anywhere in the, in the body starts to then happen in the brain itself. And you see here, this is a blood vessel. It goes through the blood brain barrier and then it affects the actual leads to damage in the brain itself. So a number of ways that this virus can impact us, which is why while we, you know, in, 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 the, in the sort of media and everything you hear about, okay, how many people are infected and how many people are hospitalized and how many people died, but we recognize that a lot of people can actually have uh, long-term consequences from this virus and never have been even hospitalized. I'll give you an example. There's a story in the papers recently by, because of one of the, one of the uh, pitchers from, uh, from uh, the Red Sox is uh, taking, taking the season off. Why? Because he had COVID and it affected his, his heart and didn't necessarily go into the hospital or anything, but it just damaged enough of his heart that he's not able to function at a high level. Same thing with the brain. People can end up with dizziness, headaches, uh, a loss of sense of smell that's oftentimes very commonly seen in COVID. So again, you know, it, it certainly affects older people to a much greater degree, um, but it can affect young people, which is why, you know, th this idea out there, just, you know, you know, it, of getting it and being immune to it. First of all, you're not necessarily immune to getting it again. We don't, we don't quite know if that's the case, but number two, even as a young person, you might end up getting significant uh, illness acutely and then long-term complications. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens. Okay, so we know all the way when the, when the Chinese started telling us about this, that these patients were suffering from a high number, high percentage of neurological symptoms, and anywhere from about 1% to 3% risk of stroke. Um, we found this to be in young people, uh, and certainly in New York, about 1.1% uh, of people were really significantly affected. Um, these strokes were large, they were small, and they also caused bleeding strokes. In Italy, which was also one of these areas that was obviously very severely affected by the pandemic, we saw that in ICU patients, patients who were admitted to the ICU, you ended up having uh, up to 6% of the patients in that ICU end up having stroke. And then in patients who were just admitted to the floor, about 2%. So not a small number when you're talking about thousands and thousands. And what are we talking about here, right? We're gonna be approaching 5 million patients uh, pretty soon. So think about all these patients who might potentially be at risk for having a stroke. Um, the types of stroke, we'll show, I'll, show you some, I'll show you some imaging of that right now. You get these big blood vessels being blocked. That's the ones I talked about earlier where the clot stops blood flow. You can get bleeding into the brain because the blood vessel ruptures in the brain, causing blood to gush out and cause damage in the brain. Uh, you can get a very small little stroke, uh, and that's because of the small blood vessels getting damaged by the inflammation. And then, of course, you can get clotting in the veins of the brain, and you can get you can get strokes because you lose uh, your lungs don't work properly and you drop your oxygen levels. That's known as hypoxic ischemic stroke. So here's a, an MRI of a of a patient that came actually to our hospital, and what you can see here is actually a couple of different. So first of all, anything that's bright white that you see here, there, 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 there. These are all fresh strokes, acute strokes. There, there. So think about this. This, this lady actually had multiple fresh strokes, acute strokes. So, and then also what you see here uh, on the up in this corner right here and here, the dark images are actually bleeding. So she not only had strokes that were caused by clotting, she also had strokes that were caused by bleeding. So you can imagine that this brain is getting uh, basically sort of uh, rocketed by this virus, right? So it's from the inflammation causing damage to the blood vessel, 
but also from these clots coming up and then from the bleeding, her brain really got a significant amount of damage from, from COVID-19. Again, not directly from the virus, but because the inflammation and the clotting caused by the virus. Here's another patient. She's 34 years old. Okay, so young lady, seven days of headaches, had COVID-19, and ended up with a big stroke right here. And you can see the stroke sitting right here. But what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is her veins. So this is what the veins in our brain look like, okay? And this is a major vein coming down here. We all have this. Um, this is basically the right, the left-sided vein, sorry, the, the, the left-sided vein coming down the left. So the sagittal sinus, which is the major vein, and then the left-sided transverse sinus, the sigmoid, and then the jugular vein right here that we can all feel. So this is on the right side. What you see that, what you don't see is a similar kind of veins on the left side. So we all have veins that start in the center, come back down here, come across the back, and then come into the jugular vein right here, right? And there should be two sets of veins that do that. So you see that there is a missing vein right here sitting on the uh, left side. Again, this is the left side of the brain. That's the right side of the brain. And when you look at these MRIs, or in this case, MRVs, you're looking from the feet up. So the left side is always here on the right side of the image, and the right side is on the left side. It's, it's sort of flipped a little bit. Again, and there's a stroke sitting in the right side of her brain. Left side, right side. This is because she formed a clot and blo blocked that vein. Now, what happens when we block veins in the, in the brain? Well, think about it. When your sink gets uh, uh, clogged, what happens to the water? It uh, flows back up and actually spills out, right? Same thing in the brain. When a, one of the major pipes gets blocked, in this case, the, the uh, right transverse sinus, you end up with basically having pressure coming back up and you start getting blood that's not able to get out of the brain. Blood is getting into the brain from the arteries, but it's not getting out of the brain from the veins. So what happens? You end up actually having uh, a pooling of blood and then you get a loss of, you basically get blood that doesn't have oxygen in it causing a stroke, but also because of that back pressure from that clogged vein, you're going to end up getting breakage of those blood vessels, those little veins, and you get bleeding. So you can get bleeding and you can get uh, like a clot type of stroke. So again, these are bad strokes. And she was, you know, a young woman again, uh, just and her main symptom before she had the full on stroke was that she was having headaches. And headaches are very common in COVID-19 infections. So basically she had a very significant clot sitting here. You, you, can't, you cannot even see the vein and we had to actually treat her with blood thinners to try and reverse some of this, and she's done well in the long run. Again, very young. Uh, here's another stroke patient, and what you can see, I'll just point out this image here all the way on, on the right side. This is a stroke in the back of the brain, back here, and when you have this kind of stroke, it can affect things like your eye movement, your talking, your ability to walk, and your ability to swallow, and things like that. So a dangerous place to have even a small stroke. Again, this stroke happened because damage to the small blood vessels caused by the inflammation. Okay, here's a different kind of a, a, a stroke-like problem. This is known as posterior reversible encephalopathy or PRESS. And here, and this is the what, you know, again, this thing, that, why this virus is so malignant. Here, what's end up happening is that, think about this. If you, because of the inflammation, your arteries become like, they, normally your arteries carry blood, and they have a very firm blood-brain barrier, which prevents leakage of blood into the brain. In this syndrome, because of the severe inflammation, you actually end up having the blood-brain the, the blood -brain barrier, the basic, which is basically the sort of the barrier between the brain and the blood, blood vessel, that becomes leaky, and you end up getting all of this basic, uh, fluid and inflammation causing damage to the back of your brain. And so this lady had, uh, could, couldn't see, she had difficulty moving her arms and legs, and this is known as posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome of press. This will get better if you can manage the inflammation and reduce the inflammation and reduce some of the side effects of the virus. And in fact, she did better in the long run because of the treatments we gave her. But again, you'll see that this virus really does a number on your brain and in many different ways um, because of the inflammation and the, and the damage to the blood vessels. So we talked about the fact that Clotting is a big issue in COVID-19. Well, it's not just clotting in the brain, it's also clotting in your legs. So about 
17 to 27 percent, as you see here, uh, of people who were hospitalized with COVID ended up having blood clots in their legs. A very high number. And of course, blood clot, these blood clots can go up to the lungs and cause even more damage to the lungs. You have this idea of systemic inflammation, a lot, your immune system just literally exploding and leading to much more damage than just the virus itself. You have this idea of the virus actually invading the blood vessel and causing a severe amount of damage there. And then by activation of certain pathways in the, in the body, it leads to even more clotting and even more inflammation. And actually production of antibodies that are not good antibodies here, they're actually antibodies that lead to more clotting. So again, a lot of the two major ways is by the severe inflammation and the damage done to blood vessels and the clotting subsequent from that. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, there are things that we look at in the body in the, when somebody gets admitted, but we know that the more inflammation someone has, the more likely they're going to die. And so a lot of our treatments right now are aimed towards how do we uh, prevent mortality in our patients? And uh, part of that is also if the way to do that in a study that came out uh, some time ago now, a couple of months ago, or actually a month ago showed that if you give steroids, when these patients are very sick, when they're in the ICU, we may be able to reduce the inflammation. Steroids actually decrease inflammation um, and then lead, and that can help with improving the mortality or the, makes the patient less likely to die. Um, so this is just the way it works. I'll skip over that for a second. Uh, we know that the virus invades blood vessel walls. We know that there's a significant amount of damage done to the blood vessels themselves. And when we do these autopsies of people who've died, we know that a lot of even the small blood vessels, and I'm not just talking about the brain here, but in your lungs, in your, in your, in your, in, in, in your kidneys and your liver can be damaged and in your gut. And again, remember that this does not mean you know, you could have this low level damage going on even though you're never hospitalized. So yes, the people who are hospitalized end up with the most injury, but people who are not hospitalized can be left with sort of residual symptoms. I have patients of mine who will, who call me up uh, you know, and say, listen, I had COVID-19, never went in the hospital, never had, had some breathing issues, but never really was bad. And now uh, you know, I have chronic dizziness, chronic headaches, um, I have difficulty uh, sort of being in crowds. This is from someone who was never hospitalized. So even in the people with mild to moderate, uh, uh, you know, uh, infections, uh, they can be uh, pretty significantly affected. Of course, there's a large number of people who don't even know they have the virus because they're able to handle the virus and not have any long-term consequences. And the problem for us as a society there is that those are the very people who end up then um, sort of transmitting the virus to people who are either compromised because of their immune system, compromised because of their other, other diseases, compromised by age. But again, the take home I really want to emphasize is you don't have to have any of that. You don't have to have a compromised immune system. You don't have to have difficulty with uh, other diseases. You don't have to be older to have a very significant uh, or bad outcome with this virus. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip through that for a second also. Um, so let's talk about how this pandemic affects, um, affected all of us, right? So um, one of the things, um, and, and I'm gonna see if I can actually see, uh, stop here and see what some of the comments, if there are any comments. So let me stop sharing and then I'll go back to, go back, go back to screen sharing. So let's see, so the, I'm gonna answer some questions here first. Uh, and then I'll go back to that. Let's see if I can get. Uh, okay, so here, uh, are asymptomatic carriers still subject to the strokes or blood vessel damage you've spoken about? Uh, so if you're purely asymptomatic, and thank you for the question, then it's unlikely that you're, you know, and by purely asymptomatic, I mean, you didn't even feel a little bit sick. Then it's unlikely that you're going to have the strokes or blood vessel damage. But, but remember, you're only asymptomatic until you have a bad event, right? Or you have something significant happen. And we had people in New York, certainly, young people coming in with stroke being the first bad symptom of their, of their infection, meaning that they felt fine. All of a sudden they had a stroke. And at that point we would diagnose them with having COVID-19. So the answer is truly asymptomatic people don't end up having strokes. 
but stroke can be the presenting symptom, the first symptom of somebody whose infection is gonna go from being completely asymptomatic to a significant infection. Um, so why were the younger patients getting strokes even before the virus? So no, I want to be clear. The patients had the virus first, and then of course, then they had clotting. Now in the past, there are many reasons why young people get strokes. We are all, this is an important thing, about 20% of us are born with a hole in our heart. That's normal because that's how, when we were in our mother's womb, we would get oxygenated blood. 80% of us, that hole closes down automatically at birth and 20% it stays open. Sometimes that hole can be a conduit for clots coming from the veins and going up the brain. Other things that affect young people uh, are clotting abnormalities. Maybe our blood clots more easily uh, in some people because of genetic reasons and they can end up having strokes. So there are a number of different reasons why young people have strokes before this virus. Um, but obviously now with this virus, a big reason is from the clotting process from the virus. Um, so uh, let me see. Uh, so the question was, uh, how can a neurologist close the blood brain barrier to the virus so would not be able to bypass it? That's of course the million dollar question. It's not even closing the, the blood brain barrier to the virus. It's actually close, it's actually limiting the, the damage done by the immune system to the blood brain barrier. It's not, we don't see a lot of virus in the brain, which means that while the virus, it, it can happen, the number of cases have been, documented cases have been pretty rare. It's really because the virus sitting here causes this explosion of, in the immune system, which then damages the blood brain barrier. So um, is this virus neurotropic? Does this virus have a pre predilection? So SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 virus, followed SARS-1, right? So SARS-1, which was the original virus that we looked at, and then there was, there was SARS-1, then there was MERS, and there's SARS, and then there's COVID-19. SARS-1 has a, has a high amount of pre predilection to the uh, neurotropic for the brain. Um, we think that uh, uh, COVID-19 also has a predilection to the brain, but not, we don't see it infecting brain as much as we saw in SARS-1. Okay. Um, uh, would atrial, would individuals with atrial septal defect be a higher risk than absolutely? If someone who has a hole in the heart already, an atrial septal defect, you know, or PFO, it has COVID-19 and they have a clot that forms in their legs because of COVID-19, which is in hospitalized patients up to 20%, but even that could be the presenting symptom, will end up having that clot go up through the heart and up to the brain. So it's much higher risk. Um, so let's see, what other questions? Um, okay, you t I talked a little bit about, a lot about treating ischemic stroke. Today. Could you talk about how hemorrhagic stroke? So let me just go to talk about that. So ischemic stroke is again, the clot going up to the brain, stopping blood flow. Hemorrhagic stroke um, called intracerebral hemorrhage is when the blood vessel in the brain ruptures because of high blood pressure, because of diabetes, because of an aneurysm, because of an abnormal connection between veins and arteries known as an AVM. And now when that, but just maybe because of high blood pressure, right? So um, when that happens, there's a lot of bleeding into the brain and then you get the sort of golf ball sized blood sitting in the brain. And when that is the, when that, when that occurs, what do you do? That causes a lot of inflammation itself. So this is before COVID obviously, right? So what you would typically do, what we do now is if in certain select people, we, we actually go in, and this is one that, what Dr. Ellis here in neurosurgery does and others do here. They actually go in for, with a catheter through the skull, drill a hole, a couple of holes and so go in and actually try and suck that blood out. Um, and that has allowed, if, if we're able to do that by decreasing the amount of blood, we think that we're actually able to save a lot more brain. In some people, you don't need to do that because the, the bleeding is pretty small. And if you just give them time, the blood will go away and then you got to deal with the consequences of the stroke. Most importantly, you want to make sure this doesn't happen, right? So we want to make sure clotting strokes don't happen, bleeding strokes don't happen. And so it's important that we control things like risk factors, like this is in your parents and your grandparents, right? High blood pressure, diabetes, smoking. These are important, the high cholesterol. These things need to be controlled and controlled with medications, but also with exercise and the right diet and also by maintaining um, sort of a healthy lifestyle. Um, 
What is the youngest patient I have seen suffer from a stroke due to COVID-19? Could it potentially affect uh, children? The youngest patient that I have heard about has been 21. Um, and uh, the youngest patient that we took care of was in their 30s. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it, it can, it's less likely to affect children. You know, the children seem to be more immune to the effects of this virus. We don't quite understand that. But again, children can, can have other kinds of I issues with this virus that uh, than adults do. So, so I think that, you know, whereas strokes are less, less common anyway in children, in, with this virus doesn't typically cause a lot of strokes in children. It does cause strokes in young adults. Um, and so that's something to be concerned about. Um, when do we use stents versus vacuum catheters? This is for clotting again, whether it's a, if it's a clot's up there. So sometimes we'll use both. It depends on how easily accessible we are to getting uh, the stent into the clot and trapping the, st tra trapping the uh, clot. And then sometimes we'll use the, the stent and the vacuum catheter. So as we're pulling that stent out, we're also sucking the clot out. Sometimes the clot is easier to get to and we can just basically suck the clot out right away without any issues. Um, so uh, let's see, let me go answer one more question and I, um, let's see. So there's a question here, which I think is a perfect one to segue into the last part of this talk, which is, with how overloaded hospitals were at the beginning of COVID, did you notice a delay or less patients making the time for TPA because of how hectic things were? And so I'm going to answer that by, by showing my screen again, because that's an important topic that we need to think about as to what, how to manage what happens next, perhaps with the second surge, right? We are concerned not only about uh, the, the first uh, surge of this virus, but even a second surge. And let me make sure you can see my screen. Josh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it, but I think you need to start share, uh, not share, start the slideshow again. All right. Um, how about now? Yeah? Uh, no, not yet. I mean, it's not a big deal if you want to just present it from here as well. Yeah, no, I just want to start from this place, yeah. Can you see the slide impact of the pandemic on stroke? Yeah, we can see that. Oh, perfect. That's good. That's what I want to present. So the question was, has the COVID pandemic affected how we take care of stroke patients like we used to normally? So giving, giving them clot busters with TPA, getting them into the cath lab so we can pull that clot out, all of that. How has it affected that? So it's a great question. The perfect question for the next part of the talk, which is, what is, what is the role of the pandemic? So this was a, a study that the CDC did, right? looking across the United States, this is back in between March and April, in March and April. And they said, okay, let's look at what happened to all visits to the emergency department and specifically for serious conditions. So think about this. In March and April, we were telling everybody to do what? Shelter at home, right? And sheltering at home uh, means you don't want to leave the house, right? So a lot of people were, were very afraid of actually leaving the house, calling 911 and getting to the hospital. So what that resulted in was about a 42% reduction in the number of visits to the emergency department. Now who comes to the emergency department? Yeah, in some cases, you know, people with mild disease, but most people would otherwise go to urgent centers, right? People who come to the emergency departments are the ones, for the most part, who have serious, uh, uh, something serious happening, heart attacks, strokes, things like that. And what we saw was this, and this is between, so the light blue line that you're seeing here is basically um, what happened in 2019. And the numbers, you know, kind of stayed between uh, January 1 and May 30th, right? So this light blue line going along here. So in 2019, you had about 2 million visits to the emergency department, uh, you know, uh, sort of, that sort of stayed pretty st steady. We got, and then maybe went up a little bit at the end of uh, May. Um, what you see in the dark blue line is what happened with COVID-19 across. This is across the country now. And you can see that the bottom fell out right about here. So right about March, all of a sudden there's a dramatic drop in the number of page people seek going to the emergency department and not basically calling 911. So if 
the people in New York remember that one of the things that we used to, I mean, if you're in New York, you're living, if you're actually staying in the city, you would hear ambulance sirens all the time. Those ambulance sirens were for people with COVID-19 illnesses, respiratory issues and stuff like that. People who did not have COVID-19 and who had regular serious stuff, heart attacks, strokes, things like that, were just not coming to the hospital. And so you see this dramatic drop that starts to recover and we've recovered, but not back to the way it used to be uh, even now. So we're now we're talking, this is, this is till May 30th, we're now in August, and we're still not back to the way we were in 2019. So what about by region, right? So basically what you're gonna see here is that no matter where you are, you know, you, there was a significant, especially in these regions right here, which included New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Massachusetts, you saw a dramatic drop in the number of people going into uh, EED. Specifically, you saw it by age, that even, you know, look at this, even the very young kids didn't go in, you know, teenagers didn't go to the ED as much, uh, young adults didn't go to the ED as much, and even the older, older patients did not go to the ED. So not just, it wasn't just the fact that it was older people not coming to our emergency rooms, but across the board, there was the, you know, there was a, a reduction in people going to the emergency room. Now, why was that? Because people were so afraid. We had told people to stay at home and people were so afraid of catching COVID in the hospital itself or by, by stepping out of their home. So across the board, there was a reluctance to go to the emergency room. This is what happened here that you see basically a stroke code happens. So what is a stroke code? A stroke code happens when somebody comes to your ER and they're having stroke-like symptoms, they activate a code. And so all of us, a whole team, you know, all of us goes down there and actually evaluates the patient and moves that patient very quickly through the CAT scan and then gives them, if, if they're appropriate, gives them clot busters called TPA or tenecteplase or else takes them to the cath lab. What you saw here again was a, February was sort of normal and then a big drop in March and April that started to recover in May. Mirroring what happened in the country, the same thing was happening in the number of strokes presenting to the emergency room uh, in New York City. This is across the board. Now, that by itself would be bad enough because it would mean that people were having strokes or heart attacks and staying at home, right? It would also mean that, you know, so it wasn't an issue that what happened to people coming into the emergency room and could they get care on time? Absolutely, we were still being able to deliver that because someone came in with a stroke. We were, we were doing the thrombectomy, the catheter-based approach. We were doing the, giving them TPA. It was the fact that people stopped coming to the emergency room. Right? So think about this. This is something called the excess mortality number here. This is the people who, sh who compared to the last year, sh died above and beyond the number of people dying in the same time in New York City uh, in 2019. So the people above that number, right? So March 11th, the World Health Organization declares that COVID-19 is a pandemic, okay? March 11th is also the first time that we had the first person die from COVID-19 in New York City. March 13th, the Department of Health has tried to identify people who had died from COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, or other causes, right? And they found that between 3.11 and May 2nd, about 32,000 people died. What was the, the sad number part, and this is really the impact that this virus and, and, it's, and not coming to the emergency room has, is that that's a 24, that's 24,000 people more died in March and April of this year than died in 2019. Think about that. Total of 32,000 deaths. 24 of those, 24,000 out of the 32,000 happened above and beyond what normally happens because of the flu, because of heart attacks and strokes, getting, you know, people dying at home. That we had this huge jump up. Now, most of those patients, of course, and you can see here, were either confirmed COVID deaths, that's the dark blue curve, or probable COVID. So this is where they had a respiratory kind of problem. They stopped being able to breathe uh, at home and they were found to, and, and while we didn't check that COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2-19 status, the, the kind of process that they died from, typically respiratory failure, breathing difficulties and stopping being able to breathe was consistent with SARS-CoV-2. So this blue line, this blue line, this light blue line is basically people we thought were probable uh, deaths due to COVID-19. But then look at the black line. 
this is so all of the difference between this black line and, this blue, and, and these blue lines is blue uh, under the curve. The area under the curve is people who should not have died, right? But we think died because they they were scared to come into the emergency room. They call it, it took too long for them to call 911 because they were afraid or they tried to stick it out. And, and most of these, of course, were probably going to be from cardiac event, but also strokes are in there. So we know that beyond the virus itself, the pandemic and how it basically really uh, scared people from coming into our hospitals um, has resulted in increasing deaths. Now this is, uh, I saw a preliminary report from hospitals in Texas and I saw a preliminary report from hospitals in Florida and the same thing is happening in Texas and the same thing is happening in Florida. So why is this important? Again, Excess deaths, 24,000. Okay, confirmed COVID-19 deaths out of that 24,000 was, thir was uh, 13 plus change, 57%. Another 21% from probable. A whole quarter, 22%, 5,293 deaths were not caused by COVID. Okay, so that's the, that's the concern here. So what do we, what do, we do? Um, it's not just a thing, this is not a historical question anymore, right? Because we all expect that especially with how much virus that we have in our country, unfortunately, right now, it's with, with so much virus being in all the states and with the there being so much community spread right now, that eventually, while each, you know, there are different regions of the state of the United States that have got are going through their surges, eventually we will have a true second wave. And this is where we're still in the first wave, right? You've all heard that. We are still in the first wave with these. Viral, virus surges that are happening are still part of the first wave. So we've got sort of mini surges like this that happen throughout the country. But overall, we're sitting at about 60,000 cases a day right now, which is much higher than where we were in April. So even as Texas and um, Arizona start to bring their virus numbers down, they're not bringing them down enough. And you can see that the number of places where the virus is not regaining a, a, a foothold is shrinking, the number of states. So we fully expect in flu season that there's going to be a second wave. And that's you know on top of the first wave that we may not even have finished by then. Um, and places like New York, again, will end up having more virus here. So what do we do about it differently, right? We know that, first of all, sheltering in place does work. But so do masks, right? Masks are very, very important. Um, you know, it's 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 not comfortable wearing a mask, but I'll I'll give you this sort of very key insight that we learned from what happened in New York. In the hospitals, we we started wearing masks very early. So I was in the hospital pretty much every day, just like others were, um, during COVID nineteen crisis, the pandemic, and when, when the numbers were high here, we all wore masks. And the rate of infection in hospital workers, in people, in my colleagues and myself, was much lower than the rate of infection in the community, which was not wearing masks, because there wasn't a guidance to wear a mask at that time. There is now a guidance to wear a mask, and in fact, it's a very common sense thing to do, not only to prevent you from giving the virus to somebody else, but from us, but also prevent you from getting the virus. So we know that even just a simple sort of surgical mask, this kind of this mask right here, right there, right? Easy to wear, and then, you know, a little annoying, um, can reduce the risk of transmission by about 70%, okay? So it is not insignificant. And we are, I, what I'm hoping is that as mask wearing becomes more and more pro, uh, sort of, the consen that the consensus on ma mask wearing increases and will allow us to get out of the politics of mask wearing and really the healthcare, health part of mask wearing, which is that if you wear a mask when you're in public, inside and outside, okay, there's less of a transmission risk outside, clearly. Um, but if you wear it consistently when you're around people, you're much less likely to, first of all, reduce the risk of getting an infection yourself. We, we proved that with the study that was done in people in, in the healthcare workers and health, health professionals in uh, hospitals compared to community people. But we also have shown that 
we might, that might be the way that we prevent a huge second wave, right? Number two, when a second wave comes, we cannot forget about the people who are not COVID positive and who are still having their heart attacks and strokes. And we've got to be able to, and this is what we did at Lennox Health. We had an emergency room that was for COVID patients and an emergency room that was not for COVID patients, that was COVID free. So we were able to actually create a separate emergency room completely. So we were allowed us to be able to take care of these patients in a way that they're not at risk for getting COVID. So I'm gonna stop there and answer some more questions. And I hope you guys have, have uh, learned and enjoyed this a little bit. Uh, so let me ask this one. So do you recommend wearing double line cloth masks? I think that cloth masks do reduce the risk of um, do re reduce the risk of uh, COVID-19 infection. First of all, wear a mask. I don't care what mask you wear, whether it's a bandana wear a, or a mask, a cloth mask, a double line cloth mask, just wear a mask. I think we need to get to the point of people are wearing masks sort of as a, just a, like, you know, I, I, I get up, I wake up in the morning, I'm going to brush my teeth, I'm going to, you know, put some clothes on. I'm not going to leave the house naked, right? Most of us won't at least. Um, so I'm not going to leave the house without a mask. And it becomes important to, to sort of think about it like that. Um, uh, but if you're going to wear a mask, then sometimes the double cloth mask can be a little bit better. But masks are masks, and they, they work. There's a question here about schools. Uh, would you recommend for mask wearing in schools when we go back to full face to full to face? Like, yes, full face to face. Absolutely. Listen, I mean, when we are sitting in our conferences in the hospital and we have meetings in the hospital, we have conferences in the hospital with six foot, six feet of separation and stuff like that, right? We all wear masks without exception. And it, I have seen it make a huge difference in our ability to, uh, to uh, in, in the probability that someone's gonna catch an infection and that infection is gonna spread. So yes, indoors, we should always be wearing masks. Um, let's see. So in the hospital studies that proved mask wearing as a positive good, were the patients also wearing a mask the entire time or just the healthcare providers? A great question. Um, first of all, patients were in their rooms. So at any time, but in their rooms, they were not always wearing their masks. You know, some patients have oxygen, they're breathing, very, they have a hard time breathing. They're not gonna be able to tolerate wearing a mask. So we would go and I would go into, into a patient's room, um, of course, gowned up, with a, both an N95 mask and a surgical mask. But remember, I was, that's a closed environment where a patient is in there coughing and breathing hard. I mean, so we know that there was a high amount of virus. But when we did that, when we wore the mask properly and we wore the N95 and then sometimes the, and the surgical mask on top of that, this is, a, again, this is for high risk situations. We knew that we actually had a lower risk of catching COVID-19. So in the, in the, in the community, you don't have to wear an N95 unless you have immunocompromised status or you have other comorbidities. You just wear a surgical mask, your risk goes down significantly. Um, did I end up catching the virus? No, no, I, I have been tested three times right now, um, just so, you know, to make sure. I, luckily, you know, I did, not catch, I did not catch the virus and most of my colleagues did not either. So we were, we were both very lucky because we were very early in this pandemic and you know, not everybody knew how to, what was the right way to do it. But we, the one constant thing that we did is we washed our hands, we wore masks all the time, even when we were not in patients' rooms. That is a huge, huge thing. And it's a very simple thing to really cut down the impact of this pandemic as much as possible. Um, let's see. Uh, thoughts on the antibody test, is it accurate? It's a great question. So. It is accurate for antibodies, no question, right? If you have those antibodies, you're gonna be accurate. But first of all, it, different antibody tests measure different antibodies. Um, you have to have a specific type of antibody known as the IgG version of it. You have to have it a high enough antibody. And then finally, while we think they are protective, we have no conclusive proof of that, right? So don't get lulled into false sense of security because Somebody, somebody has antibodies that they can't get it again. Um, we don't know the answer to that. In most cases, people haven't, but there have been some reported cases where that's occurred. And also, more importantly, we have certainly people who have had clearly antibodies, and those antibodies have diminished and gone over time. So how long will the antibodies last? We don't know. 
What is different about the vaccines is this. The vaccines are not just there to produce antibodies. We, the hope of the vaccine is that they will actually activate what is called T helper cells. These are cells, lymphocytes, white blood cells in our, in our bloodstream, in our body, that can produce antibodies when challenged by the COVID uh, uh, virus again. So if they see COVID again, or if they see COVID, they start producing those antibodies. So that's, that's where we think that the, if there's going to be a successful vaccine, besides delivering uh, antibodies right when you get the vaccine, it will create a, a line of T helper cells that will be able to produce these antibodies that will fight the virus. Okay, um, uh, are certain groups of people more likely to have antibodies at random? I think it's really just, if you have had the infection badly enough, you're most likely gonna have antibodies. Doesn't, we don't quite know what that means, especially they may be protective, but certainly how long and how much, we don't know. Um, uh, would you recommend participating in phase three trials of the vaccine if given the opportunity? I would, okay. So I think you have to, be, you have to look at number one, um, what are the phase, are the phase one and phase two trials if they, as long as they have safety? I have a little bit of concern of how fast the vaccine production is going, but essentially I think if, if the vaccine is in phase three trials, um, it's, it's going to be important to participate. The reality is this, you could have the best vaccine production and until you get to phase four, and phase four is once the vaccine has been produced and is out there in the market, we won't know the true safety of the vaccine. Having said that, I'm a big believer in vaccines. I believe the vaccines are the way to go if we're going to, if we're going to stop this pandemic. I think vaccines are the way to go for flu. I think vaccines are the way to go for a lot of different things. And 99% of vaccines are safe. So, you know, again, we'll see what the, the, the studies show, but I'm optimistic that we will have a vaccine at some point in 2021, and then that will be the way to move forward. Hi, Josh. Hey, Dr. Azar. We're going to cut you off here, but thank you so much for speaking today and coming. Good. I appreciate the opportunity. Enjoy the rest of the um, lectures, guys, and um, take care of yourselves. And thank you, Josh. No problem.